Sometimes the toughest thing about doing a podcast is that you have to watch an entire Marvel Netflix show in less than a week. Um, is that really that hard? Shut up, this is my monologue, because this geek history lesson review of Jessica Jones Season 1 is now in session. God, I need a drink. Hello and welcome to Geek History Lesson. I'm Jason Inman. I'm Ashley Victoria Robinson. Prepare to enter your mind university because you have stumbled across the podcast where we take one character, construct, or TV series from pop culture and tell you everything that you need to know about it in about an hour. Or we review it like this week because we're going to review <laughs> Jessica Jones season one. Now, the last couple episodes uh, before Thanksgiving, we uh, did Jessica Jones's history. We did the Purple Man, mm-hmm. Zebediah Kilgrave. Or was it Frank? What did they call him? They show? called him Kevin. Kevin. I want. I don't know. <laughs> I I wanted to call him Frank for some reason. There you go. So um, we did those, and now we decided we were going to watch all of Jessica Jones season one. We're going to give you our thoughts about that because we've done that. So you know, hopefully by this point you've watched Jessica Jones. We we were past the two week park. It is spoilers aplenty. Spoilers now. all over the place. So there are going to be spoilers like crazy for Jessica Jones season one. So if you have any interest in watching Jessica Jones season one, I would go away right now and come back and listen to this episode in the fall. Far, far future. Hello, future people. Now, Jessica Jones, this is a short synopsis for you, is following a tragic end to her brief superhero career, Jessica Jones tries to rebuild her life as a private investigator, dealing with cases involving people with remarkable abilities in New York City, while also having to tangle with her old enemy, Kilgrave. Uh, Jessica Jones, played by Kristen Ritter. Kilgrave is played by David Tennant. The Tenth Doctor the, himself. Well, not quite, but yeah, the Tenth. <laughs> uh, <laughs> technically the Eleventh, but <laughs> well, <laughs> he did a couple of those in the show. I noticed he did a couple like I think it must Tenisms. Be, it must be so well ingrained into him. But that the accent <laughs> that he's doing uh, for those who don't know, David Tennant is in fact Scottish. Yep. Um, the accent that he puts on for Kilgrave is his Tenth Doctor kind of upper class English accent. It's it's it, it, it's it, it's a it's a lower more raspier version but it is like yes it's, it's the, more sinister but it's more the uh what's the shakespeare dialect help me out rp uh, received pronunciation yes it's more yes. it's it's his rp because you can actually hear david tennant's real accent in broadchurch the bbc's broadchurch mm-hmm. which by the way is a great show you should go check it out yeah don't watch grace point um yeah don't <laughs> yeah it, grace point's the american version of broadchurch <laughs> but enough of david tennant yeah but there were a couple times in jessica jones where he went wow yeah 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 <laughs> and you're um, like where's rose <laughs> <laughs> yeah you're like you're gonna pull out your sound of screwdriver what's that gonna happen but, um, so basically Jessica spins how would you describe the season one of Jessica Jones like if you could put it in a sentence or a couple sentences um, Jessica Jones struggles to be the to live up to her standards as because she's, she's a good detective um, and balance out her personal life and deal with a traumatic past sure that's pretty good. And basically hunting kill great. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So let's get into some general non-specific thoughts. Should people watch it? Ashley, yes or no, should people watch Jessica Jones? I will allow a middle ground here. Mm, yeah, I'm going to take the middle ground because... <laughs> okay. Um, uh, some of the subject matter that we deal with is tough. Okay. Um, Daredevil deals with a lot of violence. Daredevil's all violence. Jessica Jones deals with a lot of things like rape and infidelity and possession Mm -hmm. and taking people's choice away and consent. And for me, that's a tougher subject matter to deal with than watching a guy get his face smashed in, which is not something that I necessarily want to see either. Um, And so I would say that if you are a non superhero person if you're not like necessarily following all the Marvel stuff if you don't necessarily know who Jessica Jones is Mm -hmm. I don't know if I would recommend this to you and if you're a very sensitive person I don't know if I would recommend it to you I think for the most part it's well done okay I think there's um I think it handles some difficult, sometimes it handles a difficult subject matter very well it's a very valiant effort to take on a lot of really important issues but I'm not entirely sure that, you know. So um, I'm kind of going to sit on the fence and be like 60 40. Um, okay. All you right. know, I think, if you're, I think if you're a superhero person, it's, it's definitely worth the time to watch despite its shortcomings. But there, there's some, diff- you know, I don't know if I'd give this to someone younger than 16. I would say yes. 
Like it's yeah. <laughs> I, I say yes, but I say don't expect greatness. Um, I would compare this to there's a show on Amazon Prime called Bosch, stars Titus Welliver. It's a cop show. It's okay. It's not great. It's good to have on in the background, mm-hmm. but it's one of those shows where you're like, ah, I got nothing to watch. I think I'll watch Bosch. That's what I compare Jessica Jones to. Yeah. If you are a comic book fan, I would say, yeah, you should probably watch it. But I found myself not being like. I would say it takes a good half the season to get going. Yeah, like 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 until David Tennant steps into the show mm-hmm. fully, the show to me, I was like not jonesing to watch the next episode. Like I was kind of like, I would watch one and I'd be like, yeah, I can stop here. Yeah, we were on like episode six or seven before we were like, hey, do you want to watch the next one like right, right now? now? And yep. we were both like, yeah, we have to watch yeah. it right now. Whereas I found Daredevil Every episode made me want to watch the next one. The I would say the thing about the thing about Jessica Jones episodes is you can see the ending coming. They mm. flag the final scene quite badly. Whereas in Daredevil, it always ended on a really good cliffhanger. Yeah. So I would say that Daredevil set the bar at a certain level and Jessica Jones comes up beneath that. I think if Jessica Jones had been the first Marvel Netflix series, mm-hmm. I might have held it in a higher regard. Where would you compare it to other shows this year? Like, um, so other, so okay. we say Daredevil's definitely better. Daredevil's definitely better. Okay. Um, I would honestly put it on par with something like Arrow. Really? I would. And I'll tell you why. Because I think that there is enough good there that balances out all the stuff that I think is ridiculous and poorly executed. Okay. Okay. Um, all right. Just look, trying to look at it more objectively because I do have a lot of problems with like some things that happen on Arrow, some of the way the story's told, and those are some of the ways the scenes are and yeah, stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Some, you know, some of the performances, and they're not necessarily the same problems that I have with Jessica Jones, totally, but totally, I, had, yep. uh, I would say I have a similar amount. Um, it's a, obviously a very different style. To very, I'm not saying if you like Arrow, you would like Jessica Jones, mm-hmm. but yeah, I would say like, you know. Daredevil, Leftovers, Daredevil, Flash, Arrow, Jessica Jones. Wow, okay. I would put, see, I would put Jessica Jones above them just for the simple fact that it's a little bit more mature storytelling. It is, but. And I would put, I would put Jessica Jones, I would put Jessica Jones a couple steps below True Detective Season 2. Um... Hmm, I'm going to disagree with you on that. I would put it like a half step above True Detective Season, season two. 2. Wow. I okay. would. Okay. Okay, so you say True Detective Season 2 is worse than Arrow. I mean, yeah, but here's the here's That's the, weird. Here's, you have a weird scale. Okay, but here's Your the, scale's weird. Here's the thing, okay? Most <laughs> they're mostly like lined up parallel and okay. there's slight differences right. between them. Let, let's not argue about uh, <laughs> let's not argue about these weird imaginative scales. Let's let, let's move on. Uh, we're going to go through all the sections. We're going to give our best character, worst character, best scene, worst scene, best episode, worst yeah, episode. Yeah, yeah. So here we go. <laughs> Let's start it off with the best character on Jessica Jones. Now, one would think the show is called Jessica Jones. One would hope the best character is Jessica Jones. One would hope that. Who is the best character? The best character is a two-way tie between Luke Cage and Trish Walker. Okay. Uh, Luke Cage played by Mike Coulter. Trish Walker played by Rachel Taylor. Trish Walker... Um, is, is Patsy Walker is the Hellcat character from the, the, from the Marvel Universe. Uh, she is Jessica's best friend and adopted sister. Um, stepping into the place that, if you listen to our Jessica Jones episode, Carol Danvers played in the Alias series. Yep, um, yep, uh-huh, uh-huh. I just think that these two characters felt the most flushed out, the most realistic. They had the most subtle performances. And there were a lot of times where I was like, can we just can we just go into their show? Can we see their show? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it's just those were more, they were characters that appealed to me more. Which I believe on the Geek History Lesson Extra, which is our Patreon exclusive podcast, you can get on Patreon if you're a $5 donor. We're going to go through and pitch what we think we are. the Patsy Walker series should be, what the Luke Cage series should be, what the Iron Fist series mm-hmm. should be. We're going to do all that just live and off the top of our heads. But in the meantime, tell okay. me who you think the best character was in Jessica Jones. Well, I think one man <laughs> stood out above the rest. And it really shouldn't be a surprise. Prize because I think this actor has been killing it since he left Doctor Who. Mm-hmm. I'm not the biggest fan of his Doctor. Uh, I think he's he's a fine Doctor. Um, I just wasn't the biggest fan of, of his stories. I thought some of his stories were silly. I will agree. But everything he's done since he left Doctor Who has been stellar. Mm-hmm. And he has been killing it. Um, and that is David Tennant as Kilgrave. Mm-hmm. I think every scene he came into, he stole. 
Yeah. So even in scenes against Luke Cage, I just can't put a rapist as my favorite character. Well, like I can't. Well, <laughs> and I'm not. I don't mean that as a moral judgment. No, that no. Just like when I was making, I was like, I, I, I get you. I get you. And let me explain. Let me explain please. because I came very close to giving it to Trish. Yeah. So close. But when I was thinking about this, when I was doing this list yesterday, I thought, no, who is the character that stands out the most to me? And it's by far and away Kilgrave. And here's what he is basically the example of. He is the personification of white male privilege. He gets what he wants. He makes people do what he what he says, and no rules apply to him. I appreciate that you, as a white male, are making that statement. He is the white male. He is he he's pure my, well white male privilege. Whale privilege. He, he's pure <laughs> whale privilege, which you can see Chris Helmsworth later attack in a movie over Thanksgiving. Uh, <laughs> That's so funny. Um, but but you know he he I don't know like. He he is that he's that personification of everything that could go wrong with males in our society yes. with consent and stuff like that. But here's the thing, and you and I discussed this a couple times when we were watching the series. You should hate this character, absolutely hate him, mm-hmm. and because David Tennant plays him, because he's so good, you sympathize with him. And here's the weirdest thing: you feel icky for it. You do, and you shouldn't sympathize with this man. At all yeah but there were scenes in this show where i was like you know what i think kilgrave should win oh really yes there were a co- there were a couple scenes where there was a couple times where i was like well jessica's a way worse person than he is yeah they do a lot of really interesting like MacGuffins and then um kind of reversal of expectation with what kilgrave tells you versus what other people tell you and it kind of leaves you to decide where the truth lies yes exactly um and i think that well, that was Kil- some kilgrave, of the better storytelling in this season kilgrave says a, a brilliant line to carrie ann moss you know where he's like oh you've heard her side of the story you know um, you haven't heard my side of the story, but you're a lawyer. Don't you know that the truth of all things is somewhere in the middle? Yeah. yeah and yeah, you're yeah. like, oh, very clever line. He killed it. And, you know, even though he was sort of playing like a sort of a cockeyed version of himself, I still thought he killed it. He got a little silly towards the end where he was like all about increasing his powers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I still thought. That was super comic booky, though. It was. It was. So the, I, I could let it go. This season kind of did go more comic booky towards the end, especially with all the nuke stuff, which we'll get to. Um, but. No other. I loved Luke Cage. I'm so excited for his show. Oh, my God. It's like two episodes in. We were yep. like, what's the Luke Cage series yeah, yeah. going to be? I loved I loved Trish Walker more than I ever thought I'd love her. Mm-hmm. But the show became its own and became the best it could be. The best episodes are in the middle. Yes. Where David Tennant showed up. Yeah. That's why he's the best. He's the best. He's the best character and actor on that show. Cool. Kilgrave. So we didn't shoot. Neither one of us chose Jessica Jones. Interesting. I'm sorry. Sorry about it. Sorry, Kristen Ritter. I didn't really like her. Uh, I'm not a Kristen Ritter fan, and the series didn't win me over. No. So. No. She was she was fine. I she had some good moments. I kind of wonder if we would have been better off going with an unknown. Yeah. Someone with more to prove. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Okay, who was the worst character in the show? Jessica Jones? <laughs> no, Jessica okay. Jones is definitely not the worst character. Okay, um, Woo! Woo! Netflix can relax. Right? No, like I said, I think I think she had some really nice moments, and actually, my favorite scene turns on her performance. Interesting. So, which we'll, we'll talk get, about. We'll get to that. Um, the worst character. Okay, so one of my problems with the Jessica Jones uh, series or the season. Oh, do tell. It's like we're doing a is, podcast about Jessica that, Jones. I awesome. know. Yeah, I know. <laughs> is that? <laughs> Sorry. You're the worst. Sorry. <laughs> Take your spoon and put it in your eye. Well, wow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one of my problems with the series is that they introduce um, she you know, she lives in this kind of crappy apartment building in Hell's Kitchen, and they introduce like all of her kind of nonsensical neighbors. Yeah, and, nonsensical neighbors. <laughs> and they're all, ex- <laughs> they're except, all terrible. except for Malcolm, who takes like eight episodes to get there to get good, right? And like gets over a, a, a heroin addiction in like two days. You know what my favorite scene of Malcolm is actually just off the point is actually the very last scene of the entire show where he answers the phone. Yes. Like, I was kind of like, that's yeah. your best I, scene. I wanted, that should have been episode six. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Um, But so they, all of her neighbors, like, I get that they're supposed to humanize her and they're supposed to be this, like, element that you can empathize with because they're not super powered. But they all sucked. And the one yeah. who sucked the worst was the girl who lived upstairs, whose name was Robin. The ginger. And Still not ginger. You know, I'm not going to say that the actress necessarily did a bad job. I think she made a very, I think she was very poorly written. I think she made a very strong character choice okay. given the given her lines, given, given her, her subject yep. matter. Mm-hmm. And I don't think any of the, the directors were like, hey, 
if you dial down to like a six, you could be a real person and then we might empathize with you because you're at an 11 and I hate you. And I hated every time she showed up and everything she said and everything she stood for. Well, you know, this is one thing (laughs) that we agree on because she's also my worst character and I do believe the worst actress on the show. Yeah. I, I get that she didn't have much to work with. She did. She really didn't. But... She was still terrible. Yes, because, and we've discussed this on some of our past reviews, there are characters that are, they're tiny little bit parts and people do amazing things with them. It it can be done. And there are also characters that you're meant to hate Mm -hmm. and you can't hate the actor because you hate the character. And, And you're not supposed to hate this character. No. You're supposed to empathize with her. She just took it too far. I, I was looking at her the entire time, and I was like, I think she wandered onto the Jessica Jones set, but she meant to go to a Broadway play. Like she, Yeah, she was too broad. She's too stagey. Yeah. Like, she was so big that I was like, you're performing for a theatrical play. You're not performing for film. Yeah, but not in the cool way that, like, David Hyde Pierce does it. Because <laughs> he's, no, he's no. very broad, but it works. <laughs> or or David Tennant. Exactly. You know, you're not you're not big enough. You can't pull it off. You can't pull off big. You can't do it. And the character just became a waste of space in her entire like Ruben. Ruben. The, 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 her and her brother were just all the neighbors sucked. Right. Her brother died, and I was like, oh, thank God, that's good. Yep, good. <laughs> I actually, when when her when her brother died, I kind of was hoping that all the people would die in the building. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. that Jessica Jones would just be alone. Or we, I was at least hoping they would like write her out of the show. Like she would go home to like. Minnesota or wherever no, they were from. No, it was just so, so annoying. Every scene with her was pointless. Was the worst. And, and did nothing to carry the story forward. Yeah. Nothing. You get to the end of the season, what did we? What did her character do? Nothing. Yeah, she got Jessica beat up. She, yeah, she got Jessica beat up, and then she's just like, oh, goodbye, Ruben, you're now in the you're now in the ocean. I guess I'm okay. You're with, now in the Hudson River, I, psych. I guess I'm, was it the Hudson River? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess I'm okay with that. <laughs> you know, and you're just like, oh, oh, oh okay. Uh, okay, all right. Um, so that was very, very, very pointless. But Ashley, mm. you want to know something that is not pointless? I do. And at, normally at this point, we would pimp our Patreon. So don't go away, because this is not about Patreon. This is not something special for the holidays. Oh, my gosh. I I am going to be doing a comic drive for soldiers. What? Yes. Uh, for the holiday season, I'm going to try to send 10,000 comic books to troops overseas by January 1st. And I need everyone, I need the Geek History Lesson students to team up with me. This is how you do it. I was a soldier once. I got care packages overseas. Your father was a soldier he was. once. Getting care packages are awesome. And what is better at a care package than a comic book? Than so a story. And a story. Yeah, something to take your mind off where you are. So I'm teaming up with Comics for Soldiers. So we're trying to get 10,000 comics by January 1st so all these troops in the new year could have something really, really awesome in the new year to read, like a Superman comic book, maybe a Jessica Jones comic book, maybe whatever comic book you want. So this is what I need. I need you guys to all donate your comic books that you don't read anymore or... Because we all, we all have closets full of them. I do. I'm, I'm going to give like 100 because yeah. I there's a, there's a bunch of them that... You know, and instead of selling them, I'd rather they go to somebody that's really going to enjoy them. And and these guys are sacrificing their lives mm-hmm. for us. They're not going home for the holidays. They're not going home for the holidays. You know, so let, let's give them something cool for the new year. So if you want to team up and help us do this, this is how you do it. There's two steps to this. And you, I need you to do both steps for this to work or these troops won't get these comic books. Okay, tell me. Um, but really quick, before I get to that, um, just to let you know. Guys, the bar have been, has been raised. I told DC Comics about this. The DC Comics? The DC Comics. The people that publish, you know, Green Lantern and Superman. They don't, they don't publish Jessica Jones. But <laughs> they, they, uh, they liked this idea so much, they gave me 2,600 comic books. What? 2,600 comic books off the bat. They were like, you tell us where to ship them, we'll ship them. So we're over a quarter of the way there. We're already 2,600. So I'll be updating you guys uh, with this list, I want to get to 10,000 by January 1st. So here's how you do it. There's two steps. If you want to donate comics, what you need to do is box and ship the comics to this address. Comics for Soldiers, care of Jawan Comic Drive, 4780 Springfield Drive, Terra Hot, Hout, T-E-R-R-E, second word, H-A-U-T-E, Indiana, 47803. The address will be in the description. Do not worry. I know I cannot pronounce that town. I'm sorry. Terre Haute Highland in French. Oh, you think that's what it is? That's I, that's exactly what it is. <laughs> I'm a stupid person. This will, be, this will be all over the social media. Yep. It'll be on both of our pages. Now, the second step that you need to do 
is you need to send a picture of your comic. So take a picture of all the comics that you're donated. You can take a picture in the box. Like you can put the comics in the box and just take a picture of the box. And the number of books that you are donating, and you need to email that to Jawin Comic Drive, all one word, J A W I I N Comic Drive at gmail.com. Now, this is why you need to do the second step. If you don't send your number to that email, we will have an inaccurate count and the drive could fail. Like we could hit 10,000 yeah. and, and we'd never know it. And we need to make sure that these soldiers get some comics. Comics for Soldiers is this really cool company, and but unfortunately, they don't have enough people to count 10,000 comics. They're a charitable organization. Yes, so we need to do it and make sure it happens. Um, and we I, can't come to your house and count your comics. And we can't. <laughs> and, 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 and if you sent them to me, it would be just a ridiculous, it would just be crazy. Like, mm-hmm. I, I don't have a big enough space for 10,000 comic books. But they do, but they don't have, they can do one of two things. They can either ship the comics to the soldiers, which is more important, or they can count them. Yeah. And I'd rather they ship them. So that's what they're going to do. So all this information is going to be down in the description. It'll be all over our social media. Please, everybody, there's flat rate boxes. Just fill them with comic books. Yeah. And I will add this. You want to send those emails because I will pick one person who emails their count. What? And we we will curate them a special box in the style of our holiday crate that they will get in the new year. One person randomly who emails their count to that email address. Wow. Wow. So that's another reason better, why you want to do it. We better make a note about that or else we'll forget about it. I, I, I already have. <laughs> All right. So thank you guys. Let's have some soldiers, the con- the John 1 comic drive. Okay, cool. So let's move on to Jessica Jones, which is also a comic book. Yeah, it sure is. Um, Ashley, mm-hmm. what was the best scene in Jessica Jones? So we said this at the beginning, but I'm going to say it again. This scene is full of spoilers. So in the final episode, episode 13, a.k.a. Smile, Jessica and Trish are going after Kilgrave and they need a code word so that Trish knows that Jessica's not possessed. And I think she says like pickles or whatever. Yeah, and then then she's like, no, it has to be something that you would never say. And Jessica says, well, how about I love you? Because she hasn't told anyone that the whole series, even though even though we know we know there's people she cares about. Do we know? We know. Do we? We know. Okay. We know at least Trish. (laughs) (laughs) Probably probably Luke. The Hellcat. Remember that theme. The Hellcat. (laughs) And and so she's down on the docks and uh, stuff happens. She winds up with Jessica is holding Kilgrave up. Oh, right. Sorry, she she's pretending that she's possessed by Kilgrave because he's telling her to stop. Kilgrave thinks that she is in his control. Yes. Yes. Um, And he says. Tell me that you love me. And she looks at Trish at Trish. And it's actually like a really nice, subtle move that Kristen Ritter does. And she says, I love you to Trish. Mm -hmm. And um, Rachel Taylor, who plays Trish, does this really nice moment where her face changes because she understands a what that means, like the subtext of that and that Jessica really cares for her. And then Jessica picks Kilgrave up by his face and snaps his neck and snaps his neck. And I just thought that. It's this. It's two very subtle acting choices made by these two actresses that is so lovely and so meaningful, and then just lets you know as the audience that like everything is going to be okay. You went for the climax of the series. That's interesting. I did because it was it was the moment that like I felt the most. Okay. So I think that's the best scene <laughs> in my convoluted explanation of it. No, that's fine. That's totally fine. <laughs> what did you think was the best scene? Well. <laughs> In, in AKA Top Shelf Perverts, episode seven. That was almost my best episode. There was a scene that, to me, summarized the whole crux of the series. Mm-hmm. And that was where Jessica Jones is in the police station and she's trying to give up all the crime. She's like, arrest me because she thinks that going to Supermax is a good idea. Yeah. Which is just like, well, one, she didn't understand that she couldn't get to Supermax like that night. It's impossible. There's like due process. Yeah, like bar breaking <laughs> into the prison itself. Yeah. Um, and then this cop just walks in and goes, oh, you're free. And then they walk out into the police station oh, yeah. and everybody has guns on their heads. And then in a full purple suit over the edge comes David Tennant. And David Tennant does this whole scene about how he loved Jessica Jones and how she's the one thing that he missed. And mm-hmm. in his entire life, how she missed. And how he's like, I'm going to convince you of your free will to love me. Yeah. And when you're ready, you know where I am. And then he just goes, oh, this is all a hilarious. In 30 seconds, you're going to think this is a hilarious prank. And laugh, and he walks out. And let Jessica I, Jones leave. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and all the cops just go ha 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 ha. And, ha, and ha. it's weird. <laughs> um, I just thought it was 
it was a twist that I didn't see coming because mm-hmm. Kilgrave loving her is not in the comic books. It's not. And I thought that it was such an interesting way to take the relationship. It showed... By having him be like, I want you to do this of your own free will, mm-hmm. again, was one of those things that I, 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 that I liked, but again, I think was kind of a mistake of the series by making Kilgrave sympathetic. Yeah, yeah. You know? It, it makes him much more likable, but it also, I mean, a, cr- a crime of passion is a thing. It makes the stakes for him much higher. Yes. But I thought, I thought that scene was just so well executed. And, of course, I had the best character in the show. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jessica didn't talk that much. And <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. You, you, give me a David Tennant monologue that's great, and and, 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 I, and, I, and I'll watch it every day. Cool. So that, that best scene. And, and, again, superpowers. Yes. And also, as we'll find out, at the very end of this episode, we're going to tell you a lot of Easter eggs that were in Jessica Jones yeah, that yeah. you probably missed. I missed two in this scene and they're very big ones dun 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 so let's move on cool. to the best oh I'm sorry the worst scene what is the worst scene in Jessica Jones anything Ashley? with Robin hey um, I, I said that too sweet I literally said any I literally wrote <laughs> that's what my note said any scene with Robin the redhead yeah yeah <laughs> you know but I said that if I had to pick a worse one I would say the scene where she's upstairs and it's her and Malcolm and it's the UPS delivery and she's just like that box has got a camera for Kilgrave yeah it's just like I get it it's supposed to be her grieving and um, I will say as someone who has grieved a dead loved one that's not how you act. No. Um, and that is, to me, it's a caricature of how you think. It's like when you think how, how you think people with PTSD act. Oh, yeah. Um, I'm so tired of that cliche, too. So, yeah, that. And then, like, when they went to the river and had their little funeral, I thought we're just terrible. Well, that was pretty simple. Any scene with Robin. Cool. Yep. <laughs> Done. All right. <laughs> uh, actually. Yes. Now we're going to, instead of talking about a scene, we're going to talk about a whole episode. A whole episode. What was the best episode of all 13 of Jessica Jones? The best episode was episode 12, the penultimate episode, a.k.a. Take a Bloody Number. Interesting. The synopsis of that is Luke recounts what Kilgrave made him do, making him realize that Jessica, what Jessica feels because of Kilgrave's connection to her, and the two work together to end Kilgrave. Mm-hmm. You learn by the end of this episode that Luke is actually still being manipulated And Luke has maybe, maybe been controlled this entire time. Yeah, like we don't know. Yeah. Um, I really liked this, um, and I realized the reason that I liked it was actually something that Jason said when we were watching it. Oh. Because we were watching it. You know, I really liked my culture. I really liked what he was doing as Luke Cage. And then Jason was like, uh, you know what's so something like you know what's so great about uh, Mike Holder's performance in this, and I was like, I don't know. And you were like, he's just soft enough that you can really like him and really empathize with him. He's not full of attitude, and he's not just this like tough guy. Like, Sweet Christmas. Yeah, I mean, he's he's got moments. Yeah. His first scene with Jessica is all attitude, mm-hmm. uh, and it's great fun to watch. But I really. The moments that I enjoyed most in Jessica Jones were a lot of these like really subtle kind of small choices that these characters were making. And even though it wound up that he was ultimately being mind controlled, he was making these really small, really human choices. And it was really easy to feel for him. And then especially when it they was kind of their, that, it was kind of their date episode. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and then by contrast, Chris and Ritter was making these really big choices that for the most part, I don't think landed as well. Um, but it. The way that it also escalated into them having to fight. And you can see Mike Coulter doing these little things with his face where he's trying to fight it, but he's like not mentally yep. strong enough. Mm-hmm. And it was something that we, I said from very early on, like in episode three, I was like, oh, they're going to make these mm-hmm. these two fight. And that was the that was the episode two where we'd seen them together in various episodes up to this point. That was the episode where I really wanted those two characters to wind up together having come through this event together. Nice. So, again, like that moment with Trish, it was the one where I felt the Aww, most emotionally invested yeah. throughout the whole Look episode. Look at you. I know, I'm Aww. romantic. <laughs> what did you think was Would the best Would you ride on a motorcycle with Luke Cage? Played by Mike Holter? Yeah. F yeah. Maybe he, and you hate motorcycles. <laughs> I do hate motorcycles. I mean, look, he was only going like 30 miles an hour. It'll be fine. Well, it was funny because, like I said, like we, we made the comment that they always cut away. So he obviously can't ride a motorcycle. Yeah. And it's um <laughs> it's it's actually a rule in filmmaking. I learned this from Ron Perlman that um, not personally from like an interview. <laughs> By the way, guys, I know Ron Perlman. Hey. <laughs> um, that My friend, Ronnie. That when you're shooting and you have to ride a motorcycle, if you don't have a motorcycle license, you can't ride faster than 30 miles an hour. Yeah. Yep. So, so they weren't going very fast. Cool. Yeah. 
Yeah, what was your favorite episode? My, well, <laughs> my favorite episode is when you got your, when you got your special girl, you want to do something nice for her, right? And what's nicer than buying her a house that looks exactly like it did when she was 13? And that is episode. What's nicer than that? Literally anything. <laughs> nope. It's, it's, you cannot beat that romantic gesture. Um, it's episode eight, a.k.a. WWJD. By the way, I love that they, they did the a.k.a. like a.k.a. alias. Yeah. You know, uh, because for a while, this series is going to be called a.k.a. Jessica, Jessica Jones. Jones. Yeah. Uh, I actually think it was a mistake not calling it. I understand for like branding and SEO. Yeah. But I think a.k.a. Jessica Jones is Makes like, it's such unique. a cool callback to alias. Mm-hmm. Uh, so Jessica experiences a strange homecoming courtesy of Kilgrave. The, her home house, her her childhood house is recreated for details. I love, so he so he invites her in, he's dressed normally, and this is him trying to play house with her. And, and I, it is funny because it's the first time he walks out without a purple suit, and you're yeah. like, oh. You're like, whoa. We're, we're in like casual Friday. <laughs> yeah, and he brings her in the house, and he takes her around the house, and he like takes her to her room, and like... He, he reveals that like he tracked down the pictures from her realtor and then he was like he was like I used the magnifying glass to identify the CDs that were on your desk and he was like that was the most difficult yeah but like it, again it was one of these moments where you're just like you should hate this guy but he's the most sympathetic like like you, you just sympathize with this dude you're like oh cr- look at how far he's reaching mm-hmm. like he like he, Jessica must truly mean a lot to him he's trying he's it's not a nice Again, gesture. He's, he's despicable. But but yeah. And it is creepy. And that's that's that that's why this is my favorite episode because it's that that line of like this is really nice. This is very creepy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like if it were nice, it would be like, "Oh, I I've seen your baby. I've seen a picture of you as a child and I noticed that you had this teddy bear, so I bought you this teddy bear for Valentine's Day yes, because I love yes, you." Yes. But he's like, "I kicked these people out of your house, recreated your childhood home that your family died in." Yes. Let's uh, have sex. Well, they didn't die. They died they died in They, they died, died on the road, that's true. But there was um, there was also a scene in it where there was a hostage situation mm-hmm. and she made him become a hero with her. Yes. And then he became intrigued by it. He was like, oh, I like this. Oh, that's cool. And she considered helping him. She considered like, if I have to give up my life to him to become a hero. Yeah, but I think if you'd done an episode, and we, we talked about what we whether we thought it was going to happen or not, I think if you'd gone and done an entire episode of them heroing together... That's what I wanted. It would have made him too sympathetic, and especially considering they killed him at the end and how far they had him go, yep. I think it would have been a misstep. I, I don't know, because I felt there was so much time, and we'll talk about my worst episode is one where I felt that the entire episode, they just wasted time. Yeah. And to me, I'm like, you know what? We could have gave that up to have a heroine episode, which would have been much, Maybe. which would have been much more interesting. They also, I think, were quite unclear about how long everything took. Because yes. there was a lot of stuff where you were like, "Wow, yesterday you were behaving like this, and now suddenly you're being." Wow, that seems like yeah. that escalated quickly. There was a lot of problems with time. Yeah, a yeah. lot of problems. They were very with time. unclear. In Daredevil, it seems kind of very linear. Like you can kind of tell the delineations in day, but in Jessica yes. Jones, you're like, some. There's some moments where you're like, "Well, a week could have passed." You're like, "And didn't you like puncture your liver yesterday?" And yeah, now you're running around. And now you're running around. And, and anyways, that. But uh, Kilgrave Plain House was my favorite episode. <laughs> so. <laughs> Ashley, now we got to talk about the worst episode. What was the worst episode you thought of Jessica Jones? Well, I actually thought the worst episode was an episode called, a.k.a. Ladies Night. It is the pilot episode of Jessica Jones. Because first of all, I pretty much hate narration. Okay. And they put a lot of narration in the opening of the pilot. They basically gave you this exposition dump. um, And they gave you a little bit at the end in the finale episode. And... um, Narration's tough because it's something that you have to be a really great actor to make interesting. It's Mm -hmm. like the problem with the opening for The Flash. Like, Grant Gustin doesn't give a good monologue in that opening monologue. No, no. So you're just like, this is really lame. Yeah, and you never you never thought that you'd be like, wow, Stephen Amell can deliver a great monologue. Right, right. But turns out. Grant Gustin. Woo! Um, and I think that Kristen Ritter's not, not, great, at the, uh, not great at the monologuing. Um, I think that they went for a lot of sort of cheap, tawdry, um, noir cliches in order to be like, look, I'm a PI and I watch people I hated. Sex. I hated the music during this series. Hated it. And um, frankly, for me, everything in the pilot, and I knew all this about her because I, like, I just read Alias, mm-hmm. um, nothing about it, including Kristen Ritter's performance, made me care. Yeah. I was like, if, if I had just been watching it on my own and this is the first episode, like, I might not have come back. Yeah. Um, and I think that again, and we've said it before, all pilots suck. 
but I don't. Most pilots uh, suck. Most pilot, like ninety percent of pilots suck. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that as long as you have one really solid moment in your pilot, then you'll mostly give it a pass. Okay. And I think that Ladies Night really lacked that in just about every way. Mm-hmm. So I just, yeah, I think it was really lackluster. Nice. And all they had to do was follow the Daredevil model because Daredevil has a great pilot. Uh, Daredevil has an am- Daredevil has a pilot that I think makes you curious. You're like, okay, I I'm interested about where you're going. Mm-hmm. And then I think episode two locks you. I agree. Like as soon as you see episode two, you're like, I'm watching this till the end. But I would say that uh, Jessica Jones for me didn't lock me till maybe episode six. Yeah, it's like episode six where I'm like, okay, let's keep going, let's keep going. Yeah. So um, what did you think was unfortunately the worst episode? I thought the worst episode was episode eleven called AKA I've Got the Blues, and the reason for oh, that yeah. is because we've built up this Kilgrave stuff. Um, uh, we've got all this like this great build up to Kilgrave. He just escaped. His dad's making him powerful. All this other stuff. And then what do we do? We spend a whole episode dealing with Will Simpson. Oh yeah. Will Simpson probably the mo- one of the most ridiculous storylines where he started out very interesting where he was this cop. I liked him in the first couple his first couple and of he, appearances. And when he teams with Jessica, you're like, "Okay, cool." And then suddenly you learn that he's Nuke from the comic books. Yeah. And if you don't know who Nuke is, Nuke is a Frank Miller Captain America character where he was like the 1970s Vietnam Captain America yeah. where he took drugs that could become strong. He's the next step in the super soldier program. Or he's the failed or it yeah, went yeah, too yeah. far. Um, but that's who Will became. And so this episode, well, this episode, I think, does have the best fight because mm. it's Trish and Jessica and Will in the apartment. Oh, that is a great... It's, Jessica Jones doesn't have a lot of great fights. That was a great that, fight. That is probably the best fight yeah. of the whole series. I don't know. Once we turned Will into a drug addict, his storyline was just w- meaningless. And again, I think that actor uh, was was generally good in that role. Yes. But he wasn't good enough to pull off the, the bad writing. No. And, and and for me, like I said, once we we, we did Creepy House episode, mm-hmm. the thrust of the series is Kilgrave. It is. And, and, and then taking a diverting from that for an it was entire all, episode. It was the entire episode. Yeah. And you were just like, oh, my God. Yeah. You know, and it was just a waste of time. And that was an episode that I felt we could have we could have got rid of mm-hmm. to give us the heroine episode. Sure. Or literally anything else. Literally anything else. That, that was my worst episode. So there you go. So now we come to the final question before Easter eggs. Watch it or skip it? I think I think you should watch it. Um, and I think that we have we've talked about some negative things. But Jessica Jones has a lot of Marvel firsts in it that I think are very, very important. It is uh, your first uh, LGBT characters are here. There's a lot of gay people in this series, which is great, and it's set in New York, so why not? Well, it's interesting too. I think it was like in episode three where I remarked, yeah, where I was, I was where I was that. like, oh, it's very interesting that the two leads of this series are a woman and an African American male. Yeah, you have your first African American lead. Mm-hmm. Um, you have not your first character, but despite. My feelings about Christian Ritter's performance. Um, you have one of your first characters dealing with trauma mm-hmm. in a very real, more than the Tony Stark, like, I'm just going to keep working. Like, uh, I punched my mic. You you have a lot of the thrust of this is like getting over it, getting over it, working through it, working through it. And like, that's a really important message. Um, I think there's a lot of really good things going on in Jessica Jones. Yeah, I'm making hand motions and Jason's making it's all fun good. of me. It's all good. Um and so I think that that, combined with the fact that there are generally good performances and there are some really standout performances, if you can deal with the difficult subject matter, if you have Netflix, and if if you're... <laughs> yeah, that, that's the first you thing. You do need Netflix. You do need Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, and if... if you, can't, it, you can't watch this on the brainwaves. <laughs> <laughs> and if... Uh, I mean, you could probably torrent it. If, if superheroes you, you are, are generally your thing, I think, yeah, watch it. I think it's a, it's a watch. I think it is watch it. Simply for the fact that if you like Marvel and you have nothing else to do, you should watch it. But I will say this: it's not groundbreaking. I don't think it's that groundbreaking. It's I'm. It's just not Daredevil. Like, like I'm it's, sorry. It's <laughs> not. It, yeah. It's not. To me, it's not Daredevil. It's a. It's a good show. Mm-hmm. It's not a great show. I'll agree. I don't think it's addictive, and I just don't think um, it will blow you away. I will say, I agree with you. 
I would have stopped if I if we weren't reviewing this for the podcast. I probably would have stopped and then like watched this a year later. Yeah, I would have. I would have. I would, I would have, have never come back to. I it, would have, but I would have taken my time with it. I probably would have watched it right before Luke Cage comes out because I would have been like, well, I gotta watch the show or, or else I'm gonna have no idea what's happening. Luke Cage, right? But Luke Cage for me. And then Trish, the more we, because Trish is kind of a slow burn, like you don't really get to her to like well, and episode Ki- three and, and four. And Kilgrave. Um, but they were the two characters that I would have stuck the series yeah. out for more than Jessica. Well, again, it's a whole thing. Like, like to me, once Kilgrave showed up, that's where I was like, okay, because he doesn't make his first full appearance where he's actually in a scene talking until like six. Five, yeah, you, I think, is the chase you, in you, the park. You see, well, even in the chase in the park, he says a line here and there. Yeah, you're right. You're you don't, right. you don't actually get to hear him speak until until right before the house episode. It was my favorite moment. Hold on a second. I am. I, I'm going through my notes. Going through my notes. Um, Jessica Jones. Episode Jessica seven. Jones. Episode seven is the first time he actually gets to say more than a few lines. Yeah. Which is crazy. It is, and 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 I don't mind that in theory because you're trying to build up the mystery. I just think they let it go too long. Yeah, they did for such a great character. They did, they did, and I, and, I, and a big thing about the series, I wish we would have had more flashbacks to their past mm-hmm. of of the I time agree. the time that she that he controlled. Her. Yeah, because that was really fascinating, and I think Kristen Ritter, those were some of her best moments. Yes, I think she played those very well. Okay, so we both gave it a watch it, but a very reluctant watch it, and well, now I'll watch it with caveats, which which go. is most things. So now it's time. To talk about Easter eggs. Okay. Actually, there were a lot. I did a lot of research on this. There were a lot of Easter eggs that we missed. And I, you know, I'm a pretty big comic book fan, but I didn't know a lot of this stuff. So we're going to start simple. And then as we get towards the end, we're going to get a lot of Daredevil Netflix connections. Because there were more connections to Daredevil Netflix than I even realized. Cool. Okay. Uh, besides the Night Nurse, of course, uh, Rosario Dawson and other things. So here we go. Starting off. Carrie Ann Moss, she played Jaron Hogarth. She's a partner at the law firm of Hogarth, K.O., uh, Chow, and Bennett's, Benowitz. Now, you know, her big storyline was the divorce thing, which we kind of, we both agree was kind of pointless. It was. I mean, Carrie Ann Moss is great, and she can be in everything, but... but <laughs> in the comics, Jaron Hogarth is the attorney for the Heroes for Hire. Who, dun, dun, dun. Who's the Heroes for Hire, Ashley? The Heroes for Hire is Luke Cage and Danny Rand. and, and The Iron Sandra Fist. Jessica later on eh, a little bit, a little um, bit. and they go around and do heroing for monies mm-hmm. in the pilot episode here's another easter egg Jessica sits outside we, when she's watching Luke Cage uh, have sex with the woman mm. she sits outside the Matador bar the Matador is a daredevil villain Oh, look at that. Yep. The first time we see Luke Cage, he's wearing a yellow t-shirt. He sure is. Yep. <laughs> now, this is one of the best characters of the show that was taken out very early. Detective Clements. Uh, um, such a good actor, too. He, he was played by Clark Peters from The Wire. Mm-hmm. The Wire, one of my the best shows of all time. Now, he, Detective Clemens was actually introduced in 2012 when... In Greg Rucka's Punisher. Oh, no way. So he's a Punisher character. Interesting. Uh, yeah, which is interesting. Again, it's one of those nice little things. I like when Arrow and Flash does that, where like any character will give him a name. Yes, like because a, why not? Yes. Um, one of the things that we said earlier is uh, the character of Trish Walker is Patsy Walker, and mm-hmm. there are times in her past when she was called that, and we call back to, in the comic, she was a, her mom wrote romance novels mm-hmm. about her, and then in this in the, the Jessica Jones show, she made her basically a TV starlet, which yep. was a nice kind mm-hmm. of callback. Yep. What's her superhero name? Hellcat! Hellcat! <laughs> 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 um... Now, in this, in one episode, Jessica goes to the hospital and she puts on a fake uh, uh, nurse outfit, remember? Mm-hmm. And she goes to a hospital computer terminal to look up files in Kilgrave. And when another nurse comes up, she spins this, like, you know, sympathetic story. She's like, I need help. I don't know how the computer works. And the nurse is like, well, who asked you to look for these files? And Jessica says she's looking for these files because she was given this job by Dr. Carter, the new head of oncology. That is a reference to Noah Wiley's character from E.R., Oh, wow. <laughs> I never, literally never would have known that. I didn't know that either, but, but, but it's, it's like, oh, wait, that's really cool, because I used to watch ER back in the day. Oh, that's um, cool. There's an, of course, there's a nice nod to Jessica Jones' jewel costume when Trish is holding up. It's literally the jewel costume. You don't see Kristen Ritter in it. No, but it looks pretty terrible. Yeah. Um, in the fifth episode of the series, when they're tracking down Kilgrave in the park, mm-hmm. uh, Will Simpson is sitting on a bench, and he is reading a newspaper. The headline of the newspaper says, Costa Verde under siege. 
Now, Costa Verde is a fictional Central American country in Marvel Comics and has played a role in two Avengers arcs. The first one was when the villain, the Living Laser, a.k.a. Arthur Parks, he was recruited to overthrow its government by supporting rebels. And later, the rebel leader, El Lobo, attempted to regain and remove the president with the help of Gypsy and Fire Lord. Wow. Now, these plots were foiled by the Avengers, and then the second one was foiled by the Thor, retrospectively. So, it's kind of up to you about which siege that is, whether it's the yeah, Living Laser yeah, or yeah. whether well it's El Lobo, and whether Thor helped him or the Avengers helped him. So, cool. it's up to you. That's a really deep cut. Uh, at one point, Jessica gives uh, Luke Cage a reference to another detective, Jessica Del Toro, who is the... Angela s- Del Toro. Is it... An- she just... A- Angela? Yes. Oh, okay. I, I, I think I wrote, wrote that wrong. It's Jessica, yeah, Jessica Yeah, it's Angela Del Toro. Uh, she is actually the second white tiger. Yes. Who was introduced by Brian Michael Bendis in his Daredevil run. Yes. Um, now, here is an amazing Easter egg. I think this is such an amazing uh, level of detail. Okay. This is where, from here on out, these are all ties to the Daredevil Netflix series. Okay. And they're so subtle, but I never noticed them, but they're amazing. Okay, I, I I think they're quite impressive. Go, go, go. Okay. Go. In the episode where Jessica tracks down with Luke, this friend of Luke's, you know, because Luke, yep. Luke, there's a brother uh, that, um, there's a brother of a sister of a friend that- uh, His name is Antoine, I believe. Antoine, yes. He's tracking down Antoine and he's like, if I track down Antoine, I get the file. So they track down Antoine to a brick warehouse where Antoine is growing marijuana. This is the exact same warehouse and the exact same shooting location as the Russians warehouse in Daredevil. Oh, no way. It's the exact same place. And bonus, when um, one of uh, um, the Russian thugs or Antoine's friend, I'm not, I'm not exactly, one of them runs away and, yes, yes, and, yes, and yes, Jessica yes. runs after him. Um, so she goes to find the, the goon. They run past broken bricks and scorched wall. Now, that's not random because that warehouse and the reason why it's abandoned is because it was one of the warehouses that Wilson Fist firebombed. Oh wow! In Daredevil season one, <laughs> I think that is such a subtle and awesome Easter egg. Um, now here's another one for you. Okay. When Jessica is being interrogated by Detective Clements in my favorite scene, mm-hmm. Sergeant Mahoney walks in. Yep. Now here's the thing: I didn't realize this was this was Sergeant Mahoney, but if you know Sergeant Mahoney. Was in Daredevil season one. Oh. <laughs> he is the police cop that Foggy keeps bribing with cigars. Oh. And also, uh, this is a little bit of a spoiler for Daredevil, but Daredevil's been out for a while. In one of the ne- last final scenes of Daredevil, when Daredevil finally has his Daredevil costume on, mm-hmm. he's the cop in the alley oh. who sees him and lets him go. That's cool. I didn't realize that was him, <laughs> but that's him. Uh, same actor and everything. And also, and finally... He probably worked for a day, right? He probably did. Um, <laughs> let's tell you where the Stan Lee cameo is. Oh, there's a Stan Lee cameo? There is a Stan Lee cameo. Cool. It is in episode seven, and it's in my favorite scene, in the cop in, in, in the cop scene. Uh, there Now, there is a woman cop holding a gun on a guy in civilian clothing. Yes. Okay. Behind the guy in civilian clothing, on the wall... Is Stan Lee in a picture dressed as a cop, like as the chief of police? Is the this is, is that the same cameo from Daredevil? It is the same picture. <laughs> I know stuff used in Daredevil. <laughs> so I I think in the Netflix shows, Stan Lee's going to be like the chief of police. That's cool. <laughs> I kind of dig. It's the it's the exact I like same that. in Daredevil. It's behind Sergeant Mahoney. That's right. Oh, that's right. Yes, cool. it, and it's in the scene where uh, Daredevil comes in and he hears the guy kill the guy in yeah. the interrogation yeah. room. Yeah. Uh, um. I think that's neat, and I think it's. I hope that carries on now, so that like there's a scene in a in a, in a police station, and we're gonna see Stan Lee's picture back. Yeah, there. I like that. So that's it. Those can are I connections. can I add some Easter eggs that I have? Sure. In the uh, in the second episode, there's a character on a dialysis machine. It is a Baxter. Yes. The dialysis machine, like the company, the, the Fantastic Four. Like the Baxter building, yes. Uh, Dr. Karada is a character that Kilgrave is using that Jessica yes. is tracking down. He's a Doctor Strange character, mm-hmm. so maybe that actor will come back with I, I, I doubt it. I doubt it, but it, it is nice. And um, uh, Simpson mentions Hammond Lab. Hammond Lab is owned by Jim Hammond, the 
first the person who built the original Human Torch, the, yes. the robot. The, the, the Human Torch that was part of the Invaders with Captain America in World War II, who yes. was also called Jim Hammond. Yes, and there uh, and there's also a place in the Six One Six universe called Fort Hammond. So that's presumably where Hammond Lab is. No, I think it's Camp Hammond. Because isn't Camp Hammond the uh, the training camp that they use after Civil War to train the heroes? Oh, maybe. I think so. Cool. We could be wrong on that. There you go. That's all your Easter eggs on Jessica Jones. Yeah. We hope you enjoyed this Jessica Jones episode. And if you were one of our lovely $5 patrons or more, of course, in higher levels, you get it. Uh, we're going to continue this conversation in Geek History Lesson Extra. Where we're we're going to pitch all the rest of the Netflix shows, including Hellcat. <laughs> <laughs> so I hope that's the theme song. Um, so there you go. So Ashley, if they wanted to talk Jessica Jones and call us complete idiots because of our thoughts about Jessica Jones, where can they do that on social media? Uh, they can do that inside their brains because I don't want to hear it on social media. <laughs> uh, you can you can disagree with me. I've had some lots of interesting conversations on Twitter at Ashley V Robinson. And where can they find you to do that? Um, at Jawin J A W I N. But I meant more like our personal oh, history um, lesson social media. Not that's okay. Well, um, don't 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 come to me on Twitter and tell me about Jessica Jones. I'm good at subtle uh, segue cues. You can I mean, it's only like we've done 91 episodes of this show. <laughs> you can find us on facebook.com slash geekhistorylesson or www.geekhistorylesson.com, uh, which is a Tumblr. You can message us every way on all of those things. They're all open. And don't forget, we are on iTunes, Stitcher, and now SoundCloud. SoundCloud. SoundCloud.com slash geekhistorylesson. You can find us anywhere on there. Don't forget, go over there and comment. Leave us a review. It always helps other listeners find us there which is really really nice Mm -hmm. and we enjoy your thoughts even if you think we're stupid it's all good so for this podcast I am Jason Inman I'm Ashley Victoria Robinson Professor Ashley please close out the case of Jessica Jones well we worked really hard on this and in the end we finally got what we wanted is this is this you monologuing this is me monologuing well time to have a drink sweet Christmas sweet Christmas